Well, good morning, church. How are we? Well, good to see. Good to see everybody this morning. I want to just celebrate. Last Sunday afternoon, we saw 22 people baptized in the Atlantic Ocean for the glory of God. It was exciting, man. It was a beautiful, beautiful day. So we now here's the thing. Here's the thing. That that should be celebrated for most churches in the course of a year. Like that's a big deal. But here's the thing. One day in the mid, in the summer. In the summer, because Jesus is Lord of the summer, just like uh, in the um, two weeks of semi-fall, forward slash winter that we have in South Florida, right? And so we're excited about that. And uh, anybody, were you mildly disturbed by the video this morning that Christmas is right around the corner? Is that not like terrifying? You're like, oh my goodness. I'm, yeah, it seems like this year, seriously, has been about two months. Anybody else, is, is, has it seemed like that to you? It's been so fast this summer, and maybe that's means that I'm getting older. So, um, but that's right around the corner. And uh, we also want to pray for our teachers, our administrators, our students, and all of our schools, all of our students, because school is right around the corner. And so, yeah, some people are excited. Some people are saying, please, Jesus, you know, slow it down, at least in my mind. But what we're going to talk about this morning is something that we don't just need when school starts. Um, when we go off to get that roommate that we didn't know before and we find that that roommate is going to quite possibly be the most helpful um, person in the history of our life and helping us learn patience because they're so frustrating. We don't just need it when we start the new job. We don't just need it when your child comes and says, this is the person I would like to marry, and you go, oh, right? And now that is the source of the pressure that is helping you learn patience. This is something that we need every single day of our lives. And um, just so you know, I don't know if this is right or not, judge me if you want, but I've kind of been dreading preaching on patience because if you notice the main idea, that this has been planned out far in advance, it is, we have it there on the screen, we learn patience under pressure. Anybody had some pressure the past couple of weeks? Anybody in the house? Okay, all right, and the rest are lying. Awesome, okay, so 20% are honest, 80% are bald-faced liars, so it's good that you're in church today, I'm just saying. So here's, here's the thing, here's the thing. Whenever you talk about patience from a church setting or if you study it as an individual, say, man, I, I, I want to I learn about what the Bible has to say about patience. Or maybe you're part of a Bible study group, a small group. Or maybe it's you know, your, your boyfriend, girlfriend, you guys are going to study that as a couple. Or, or if you've been married for more than you know, six months, say, honey, we need to learn patience, right? Whatever season you find yourself in, guys, this is quite possibly one of the most difficult things to learn. You know why? God most often does not teach us patience by filling up his sovereignty syringe and sticking it into the IV of our soul. And just all of a sudden, we wake up and we're like, this magic moment, oh, I feel, I feel great. Boy, yesterday I had a I, I was short with somebody at the office, and I, I was just, I was getting road rage, and the people actually, like they actually, well, we were able to make the light. I know, by the way, in Palm Beach County, you know why we make so few lights? Because everybody's on their cell phone. I'm preaching, I'm getting frustrated. Pray for me, all right? Listen, through, through, all, through all of that, we often don't receive patience through some spiritual pill. We most often learn patience through the sovereign God of the universe allowing us to walk through a situation, and through that situation, we are under pressure, and we learn patience that way. So here's what probably will happen if part of your prayer journal has been, oh God, I want to be more like you. Give me patience in Jesus' name. God hears that prayer. He says, every good and perfect thing comes down from above. I'm about to give you some patience, but what I have to do in order for you to understand what patience is, is give you a situation under which you will be under pressure. Y'all all encouraged? You ready for today? 
I'm sure we have some people watching online that we're watching online that are no longer watching online. But as, as we go into the text, which, by the way, open your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. will be in verse 22 and James chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, that it just showcases in vivid detail patience. But if you notice that today in 2019 that it's almost like we've been programmed to be impatient. You ever notice that? Like when you send a text message and maybe you're at that um, section of the uh, Publix there in Royal Palm Beach and it doesn't have that, that good of a signal and we're like, come on, it's been 10 seconds. Like, really? Like, it's, go- it's going, it's, r- really? Like, think about when you've been on a, pl- a flight before and they say, we have free Wi-Fi. On this flight, we're like, right on. And then we, we hop on YouTube to watch a cat video, and then we're like, it's not loading. It's like you're 30,000 feet in the air. And we get frustrated. Not us, other people, right? Not us. But do you remember just not too long in the past when you needed to go to the library to look up a book, you students, you, you went to something called a card catalog and you pulled it open with your hand and you found a card, a physical card, and that led you on a wild goose chase to finally find the book. Years ago, we would, we would laugh and wonder, say, man, what do you think we'll look at? What, what do you think we'll look like 40 years from today? And now you can download a face app and see what you look like 40 years from today and give your information to Russian hackers. But in the past, in the past, things were not as fast as they are today. For, for example, we have a few photos to illustrate this on the screen. Number one would be just like a, um, a 16th century Spanish galleon, right, coming across the Atlantic Ocean. A, a standard voyage was around six weeks. Missionaries would have to wait for their letters six weeks to, to Plus, to arrive back to their sending churches, then it would have to be sent back, just a very slow time. Uh, Some of us remember retro, uh, back in the 90s, the Oregon Trail computer game. Any guys, you remember that, right? The Oregon Trail game. Back in the actual Oregon Trail, literally a wagon pulled by animals walking across the continental United States. And for some of us, it's like, I love polio, but it's like 15 minutes away. I don't know if I can make it there and back. I'm going to get, that's just too far. Think back here in this country of the early trains, uh, the iron horse as it was known. Uh, people could say, man, I, we can actually go coast to coast. How incredible, that, how fast that is. And for some of us, we're like, it's too slow for me to jump on a train to go to Miami. And then the Sears Robot Catalog. When you could mail order stuff and have it delivered to your home, just a matter of four or five weeks. I mean, how, how awesomely fast was that, right? My goodness. And today we have something that we know as Amazon two-day delivery. It's just wicked fast today. But the Bible, over 2,000 years ago, says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience. And as we've looked at every message in this series, as we walk through the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, that the fruit of the Spirit is singular, not plural. So if we're teaching a Bible study, we don't say uh, the fruits of the Spirit. We say the fruit of the Spirit because it all works together, right? So there are different angles of the fruit, but you can, as many preachers have said, you can fake a couple of them. But you can't fake all of them. And in order to exercise patience, you must be at peace. So that's just a small glimpse on how it all works together. But let's look first at definition before discourse. What is patience? A couple of definitions there in your notes. Number one, biblical patience is a God exercise or God given restraint in the face of opposition or oppression. But it is not passivity. Sometimes we get the idea that patience is just kind of sitting back and say, well, you know, God, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen, almost like a form of fatalism, right? As we'll see this morning, patience is not fatalism, nor is it passivity. Also in your notes, patience refers to that quality of mind that disposes us to take everything in good part and not to be easily offended. 
It is the ability to put up with other people even when that is not an easy thing to do. Patience in this sense, of course, is preeminently a characteristic of God who is long-suffering with his rebellious creatures. Now, dwell on that for just a moment. We are the only one of God's creations that does not do what we were created to do. God created most birds to fly, and they fly. God created dogs to bark, and they bark. He created horses to do the horse thing and cows to do the cow thing. But it's only humanity. God created us to have that relationship with him, but it's only us that push back against the design for which we were created. And so when we think about the patience of God in the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, with God's people, we see how patient God is. And it's actually God's patience, patience theologically, doctrinally, it's God's patience that allows for the possibility of any of us to have a relationship with God. Because if God was not patient, there would be sin on our part and an immediate judgment. But God is patient. Patient. And patience is not passive. That may be, and again, another good thing to underline or write down. Patience is not passivity, but patience is an exercise of faith. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10 says that these things are written so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit. The promises. So faith and patience both work together. So let's take a look at James chapter 5, beginning in verse 10 and 11, to see how the Bible explains uh, these realities. The Bible says, as an example of suffering and what? Patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remained steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness or the patience or the endurance of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. So let's walk through these verses as we look at pressure and patience. And as we walk through these verses, let me say again, if you're new to grace, um, our understanding of the Bible is that God's word is without error, that the foundation, the authority of the Christian church, whether we are willing to admit that or not, is not on a personality. It's not on a preacher. It's not on a certain mode of dress. It's not on how we do our music, but it's on the authority of God's word that has stood the test of time. So that's the reason why on Sunday mornings, whether it's me or another pastor when we take a passage of the Bible and we walk through that, we don't try to do a patchwork thing to try to make the Bible say what we want it to say. We want to hear what God actually has to say. And so that's, that, that's our understanding of the Bible, and we believe that that's where the change and the power comes from, not from personal or um, human creativity, but from the power of simply reading the Bible, explaining what we read, and then applying it to where we are here in the 21st century. All right? Okay, so let's jump in. There in verse 10, uh, we see the text, as an example of suffering and patience, again, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. I mean, this is a powerful encouragement for all of us to live like an ancestor. We're like, amen? Like, I don't, I, what, what do I do with that? Now, we've been in a, a leadership study uh, with a group, and one of the statements was made uh, in the last session uh, that all of us uh, were going to be ancestors at, at some point, so live like it. Like, when we look back on our family, we all have family members who left different kinds of legacies, and the question we need to ask ourselves this morning, man, whether you're a student, whether you're in middle school, whether you're in high school, uh, a 20-something, whether you have your kids, whether you're a grand or great, 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 great grandparent, maybe you remember when Sears and Roebuck catalog actually came out. Regardless of your age or life stage this morning, we have to ask the question, what example do I want to leave future generations? Not what stuff. Not, not what stocks and bonds and properties and four-wheelers and cars, but what example do I want to leave future generations? Like, what, what will they remember about me? Funerals are interesting things because funerals, whether we realize it or not, often that's where what the person really believed and was about came out. 
Like a person can come to the end of their life, and I've heard kids say stuff like, well, you know, he, he really liked watching NFL football. Nothing wrong with that, but like that, that, that's what, that's the legacy. Well, she loved, she really loved to shop at Forever 21. Man, she loved that. She loved that store. She loved that. Nothing wrong with going to shop in the store. But, but those types of things, as opposed to, man, you know, they, they enjoy doing this, they enjoy doing that. There, there is something about mom and dad or my brother or my sister to where they, like, yeah, they enjoy doing stuff like the rest of us. But there was something deeper, something more meaningful, something that we could tell. And they tried to explain it to us, their rock-solid faith in who God was. We don't even, sometimes we don't know how to talk about that. We don't know how deep we should go. It's, it's kind of uncomfortable. But we knew that they were rooted in in something far deeper than just stuff. So live like an ancestor. Every single day we are building that legacy. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, I, I'm not really proud of the legacy that I've left. In fact, I, as I've been at a church for a long time, or maybe I'm here for the first time just learning uh, about the Lord. Listen, your legacy can change whenever you repent. If you come to a place of genuine repentance, hey, listen, in church sometimes we say, well, yeah, if you've been drinking too much, you're on drugs, you, you know, lost your house, lost your car, lost your dog, all that, well, Jesus is here for you. That is true. But listen, you can be killing it. Six-figure income could be a thing of the past. You could be seven-plus-figure income. You're like, well, I don't really, I don't really need it. Yes, you do. If you don't think you need God because you've been successful, you have become intoxicated by your own success that will lead you straight to hell. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul? So whether you're starting over or whether you have hundreds of people that report to your organization, we all need Jesus. We all want to leave a genuine, rock-solid, real, lasting, meaningful legacy, and that all begins in a place called repentance. So whether you've been on skid row or whether you were rolling with the highest rollers that could be rolled, repentance and humility and coming to Jesus to say, I know I'm a sinner, but you're a great Savior. That legacy can change on a dime, and you can begin building your faith in Christ today. What heritage did the prophets leave? Notice, example of what? Verse 10, suffering and patience. Why did they suffer, and why did they have to be patient? The verse says, because they spoke in the name of the Lord. 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah, one of the greatest prophets in Israel, was called by the king, quote, the troubler of Israel. And when you look down through the ages, the people of God who have not compromised on the Bible, they've always been referred to. The names change, the terminology shifts, but the troublers of the city. It's like, well, everybody believes that there are many ways to God. Why do you Christians have to be so dogmatic that Jesus is the only way? Well, because he is. Like, we didn't create that. That's what he said. That's what he did. The troubler of Israel. When you look at the history of communism, Christians, the true church that did not compromise, were routinely called the troublers or the dissidents of the, of, of the, the society and the culture. In the Muslim world today, Christians are referred as, to as the troublers of the Dar al-Islam, the land of Islam, the ones who do not walk to the same beat of the drum. And here we are in the 21st century, but brothers and sisters, I'm telling you that it's changing. If you pay attention to the shift going on in the geopolitical reality of nations, of the world, nations are closing to the gospel. One after another. After the Soviet Union fell in the early 90s, many of those Soviet satellites, many of those places end with Stan. They opened to the gospel. I was able to go uh, to one of those places in the mid-2000s, but those are quickly closing to the gospel. We don't know how history will turn out as far as political or religious freedom goes, but we do know that Jesus wins, but we also know that persecution has always been normative for the people of God. 
Like for us to be able to gather and do this thing. And by the way, you guys encourage me more than you know. In the middle of the summer, you guys say, man, we're still going. We're still serving. We're still giving. We're still going to be, we're still going to pray. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reach people in the middle of the summer. But listen, the fact that we're able to do this and anybody who wants to find us can find us because we have a sign, we have a building, we have seats. This is not normal. The church most often has been under persecution, but I praise God for the faithful men and women of all nations throughout the centuries that have said, I will not back down. I want to leave a legacy for my people in my culture, in my generation, in my neighborhood. Everybody else, it seems, may walk away, but I will not walk away. Here I stand in the words of Martin Luther, I can do no other. And so here's something, guys. I just want to give you a free tip. Here's how you can save yourself a lot of pain in the 21st century. Compromise and walk away. So I got to do. You want an easier life? Just compromise. Say the Bible really doesn't say what it says about the exclusivity of Christ. Say, well, Jesus really didn't mean what he had to say about the family and sexuality and gender. Well, Jesus really didn't mean what he said uh, when, he, when he calls out our greed. I got claps in the first service about the greed part. Maybe not. Maybe this one just... You know. Like, all we have to do is compromise. But here's what always happens for the local church. The church that compromises, the next generation figures it out, that why do I need the church if there's nothing really here? If it's not true, if it's not rock solid, if there's nothing, there is like, mm, like that's bigger than me, bigger than us. Like, that's, that's a God-sized thing. Like, if it's all just, hey, man, be a nice person, you know, treat your neighbor's dog well when it comes over. Like, who cares? Go to the beach. You don't need this. If it's just some exercise in mutual admiration. But if Jesus did rise from the dead, and if he did give us the Bible that he's preserved throughout the centuries, and if we are seeing people transformed in this church, coming from death to life. They say, I was once blind, but now I see. When we see dads getting right with Jesus and loving their wives and loving their kids, and we see mom getting right with Jesus, and now she's loving and respecting her husband, and the family gets transformed. When people see that, and when they, when they see that there's no compromise, not because we're arrogant, but because we want Jesus to be in control of every person in Palm Beach, County, when we want to see revival and heart change, when people see that, not only do they stick, but they say, I'll be a part of that. I, okay, sign me up, let's go. Like, think, of it, think about Marine Corps recru recruiting for just a minute. I tell these 17, 18 year old guys, hey, look, we're going to pay you nothing. It's going to be horrible. Boot camp, you're going to have guys screaming at you, they're going to be talking about your mom. We may send you to some place, you may get shot at, and you may die. Like, what, what kind of a recruitment method is that? It's golden because it gives the young men on the front lines son, say, this is worth it. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay, all right. Big enemies, big order, okay. I may not know how to do, do it right now, but I have a desire to serve somebody to stand for something bigger than myself. That's how you get the cream of the crop. You don't get it by offering a plush example of doing nothing and saying nothing and standing for nothing. The example of the prophets is that they spoke and lived in the name of the Lord. They said, man, I love Elijah. Woo. Man, I'm telling you what, you need something to read on Monday morning to get up ready to punch the devil in the face, read about Elijah. He says, I'm not the trouble of Israel. To the king, he says, you are, because you have forsaken the Lord your God. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Let's remember this when we tell our friends and our family members that don't know Jesus yet. It says to preach the word with great patience. We are called to share the word, but to do it with great patience. Because how long did we hear the voice of the Lord through the word and through our conscience before we listened? Verse 11, behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. This is telling us that the good life is not necessarily the easy life. Let me say that again, that the good life is not necessarily the easy life. Notice that the blessing followed those who remained steadfast. 
Remember the ones who have walked before you there in verse 11. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job. And so for a few moments, I want us to take a, a trip back to where the Bible is leading us to go when it, when it deals with patience. So let's look at this guy named Job and his suffering and how God used that pressure to bring out something beautiful. The story set up in the book of Job was that Job chapter 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and the man was blameless and upright, who feared God and turned away from evil. I want that guy on my team. This is a guy who had clearly experienced grace and truth. And Satan notices this, and God had been blessing Job in every way imaginable, and Satan comes before God in this really interesting and intriguing enigma of a story, and Satan says, hey, I know, I know Job is your quarterback. I, I, know, I know he's the goat in the sense of, of your people, God. But um, I think that he's faithful to you because you bless him. So if I'm able to take away his blessing, then I wager he will curse you to your face. And so God allows a little slack in the chain around Satan's neck. Satan takes away Job's... <clears throat> possessions and his children. There's the loss of wealth and animals. Just in a small snippet of time, natural disasters and human crime strip Job of his wealth and his children. But he does not curse God. Then Satan comes back before God and he says, skin for skin, all, all you need to let me do is just take away his health because money is one thing, but if I take away his health, then he'll begin to curse you. And so God allows Satan to take away Job's health, and he's got this unexplainable onslaught of this, this disease of running sores, and the description in the Bible is just horrendous. And Job is suffering, but he does not curse God. He loses honor in society. There's the loss of his relationships. I mean, he has ten children, and in a moment, this natural disaster strikes, and they, they, all, they all die. So Satan takes away all of his money, all the houses, all of the animals, everything goes down. His children and his health, but he leaves his wife. If you've heard the story of Job before, Job's wife, she, a lot of teachers give her a hard time. But Satan leaves her and she says to Job, curse God and die. Now, before you're too hard on Job's wife, she lost 10 kids in a moment. And then Job's friends show up. Friends, quote unquote. And they start, they start these long descriptions of saying the reason why all these things have happened is because Job is sinned. They're like, well, the reason why bad stuff has happened is because you've been bad. And there's one of his friends named Zophar basically said, man, you deserve worse. And here he is. He's lost all of his possessions. He's lost his health. He's lost everything except for his wife whispering into his ear, curse God and die. And his friends are producing enough hot air to heat a northern city in the middle of winter. Notice verse 11. And you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Brothers and sisters, if you're walking through a time like that this morning, we need to remember to accept that your inability to fully grasp God's present plan does not mean that there is not a purpose. Imagine where Job was there in his suffering and in his pain. And he begins to, to come to the point of saying, you know what, guys? It was probably better that I would be, it would have been better if I had never even been born. Have you been to a point like that in your life at any point? I mean, I just, you may not have said it, you may not have articulated it, but it's like, boy, with what I've had to walk through, and I don't even know why I've had, to, why these things have happened. Maybe, would, maybe it would have been better if I just would have never been born. And Job begins to ask God and plead with God, why are these things happening? And then God's response is fascinating. That for several chapters, God begins to ask Job all of these questions that really can't be answered by Job. 
So Job is asking this huge question like, why are these things happening to me? And God asked him questions that really can't be answered. So in Job chapter 42, verses 1 through 3, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, notice his response, therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me that I did not No. God was telling Job, he says, if you can't answer these questions, then how can you you absorb the massive question of why I hand suffering to different people at different times? But for Job and for us, remember that your present suffering is not the final chapter. That your present suffering is not the final chapter. I mean, in Job's life, everything started out good, so it seemed. And then it was like a painter who begins to paint on a canvas and just paint's thrown all over it. It looks like an absolute mess. But the longer the painter begins and continues to paint, it looks less like a mess and more like a masterpiece. And then God shows up. And God says, Job, in so many words... I am angry at your friends because they have misspoken. Job chapter 42, verse 8, and God says this, And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly. Okay, time out on the sidelines. You're Job. You've encountered all of that loss. You have your so-called friends who come and heap misery on top of loss. They, they were the type of people, you ever talk to somebody and they just love to hear themselves talk? Like if they could, they'd give themselves a double high five. They're like, well, in my estimation of the philosophical, mm, that was really good. And you're just like, stop. You don't give them a closed fist healing, amen? You know, it's like, stop. Humility, that's what you need. These guys, they, none of them stopped. No one came to Job's aid. They just piled on his dog pile. And the lowest point in his life, and then God shows up and he says, I will give them grace if Job prays for them. All right, so imagine you're Job for just a minute. You've been through all that. You and the Lord have worked out a lot of things. You, you, you understand now that the Lord is sovereign over all, and, and he, he, he's wiser than you are. And then you got these group of friends that are more like persecutors, more like enemies. And God says, I'm going to get them. But if you pray for them, I'll give them mercy. Hmm. Somebody tracking with the pastor this morning? It's like, well, Lord, I I can pray about them, but I don't really want to pray for them right now. In that moment, guys, this this is the whole sermon right here. In that moment, it was a hint. It was a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ himself who would come into this world and declare to his followers that when you are persecuted, Pray for your enemies. Job chapter 42 verse 10 says this, and this is the whole book. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. In that moment, I'm going to be honest, I wouldn't want to pray for my friends if those were the type of friends I would have been shown to have. But Job, in the moment, the, the most difficult season in his life, kneels before an almighty God and he intercedes. He stands in the gap for his group of jerk, arrogant, self righteous, talk all day long and not say anything other than to build their own ego, quasi friends. And it says, and the Lord, when Job prayed, gave Job twice as much as he had before. And when you do the math of Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 42, and Job chapter 1, Job had 7,000 sheep. Job chapter 42, he gets 14,000 sheep. But in Job chapter 1, Job had 10 kids. And in Job chapter 42, God gives him 10 kids. Well, it should have been double, right? The first 10 kids, Job had destroyed, he had tried, he said, God, I'm going to make sacrifices on their behalf. He wanted them to be right with God. 
he never lost the first ten because he would see them again. And notice the text says again in verse 11, and you, speaking of us, of believers, we have seen the purpose of the Lord. The word purpose is tell us, point, end, design of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. In other words, we're on the other side of the mountain, brothers and sisters. That we can look back and see God's plan in Job's life, but we're not on the other side of our mountain yet. And I truly believe the temptation to every single one of us when we walk through a time of pressure. There's the tendency in that time of pressure, instead of crying out to God like Job did, and say, oh God, I don't know what you're doing here. I don't know why these things are happening, uh, but but I want to remain faithful to you. Brothers and sisters, there's the temptation to say it's not worth it. God either doesn't exist or he doesn't hear, or if he does exist and he does hear, he doesn't care. But just because we can't see how God's purpose is working all things together for good doesn't mean there's not a purpose. So what's God working in your life? Throughout the Bible, we see the cry, how long, O Lord, how long, O Lord, from the prophets of the Old Testament all the way into the book of Revelation. And that could be maybe some of us here this morning. We say, Lord, how long? Like, how long, oh Lord, if that's your prayer, that's in the Bible. I don't know about you, that's encouraging to me. Amen, church? It's okay to ask questions, but in those times of pressure, of patience, that God is working in us, lean into the Lord, even when you don't understand all of the aspects, because you understand that Jesus Christ is a mighty, awesome Savior, and his word is absolutely true. And he will, and he will carry you through, and through that opportunity, through that time, produce in you what was not there before, but he produces patience from that pressure. 